Hello and welcome to this week's edition of the Glasgow Times News Podcast, normally recorded in our studio at the Bishop Briggs Media Centre, currently recorded from our volunteers' homes. To keep in touch with us, use our social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter, which are all at Q and Review. That's C-U-E-A-N-D-R-E-V-I-E-W. Or get in touch via information at qandreview.com. That's information at c-u-e-a-n-d-r-e-v-i-e-w.com. Please like and share our podcast and give us any constructive feedback. Evening Times, March 31. Lifestyle. Glasgow Coffee Festival returns for the first time in two years. Report by Paul Trainer. The Glasgow Coffee Festival returns to the Brigate on May 7 and 8 for the first time in two years. Organiser and Dear Green founder Lisa Lawson is excited to bring together the local roastery and cafe scene to showcase the skills and passion you will find in the city and across Scotland. Coffee and cake kept us all during lockdown. With people stuck at home, they were buying more coffee online and upgrading their equipment. We couldn't roast coffee fast enough in our East End base to keep up, Lisa says. Then you saw that coffee shops had queues down the street. In areas of Glasgow, people stayed with their local cafe through it all and they built up more business. I think people have got into the habit of it now, going out for a coffee, to meet friends or as part of a walk. I think as the cost of living goes up, you will find that these little daily treats will become quick fixes that just make you happy. Hospitality has been through a period of introspection and this has led to more cafes and restaurants considering what kind of coffee they want to serve. More people are gravitating towards the industry. There's a boom in the band. Lisa says, you can see definitely that a lot of folk are changing their coffee habits, becoming more engaged and more discerning and starting to try different roasteries and drink single origin coffees, understand more about the product and where it's from. It's become something to really engage with. There's definitely been a shift to support local. This will be the seventh Glasgow Coffee Festival, which will also involve a two-week element, which will chart out a tour of local coffee shops, taking the event out across the city. Across the weekend at the Brigate, you can meet Gordon Street Coffee, Bare Bones Chocolate, Andina Coffee, Thompson's, us v them and Broken Clock Cafe, alongside visitors like Cairn Gorn Coffee, Steampunk from North Berwick and Mosquil Organic Farm. There will be talks and demonstrations and latte artists. Lisa says the wait will be worth it. She continues, there's loads of people that bought tickets in 2020 for the festival that we had to cancel because of the pandemic and they didn't ask for refunds. They had faith in us to do a festival again, when maybe we didn't have faith in ourselves. We have the full festival now, and it is predominantly local roasters. It just shows you how things have changed in Glasgow. When we started, there were about two roasteries. Now we can create a map of over 50 amazing speciality coffee businesses. Deer Green is part of a new Glasgow food and drink collective working together this spring to celebrate the best of the city and make some noise about everything it has to offer. Businesses include Stravagan, The Finiston, The Gannet, Marsanta, Platform, Gamba, 88, Hooligans and Red Onions. Ajay Kumar Chef Director of Swadesh, the Indian fine dining restaurant on Ingham Street, has joined Made in Glasgow 
because he believes in the quality of local hospitality. He says, this is a chef-led restaurant, and I know there are businesses that put their heart and soul into the food scene in Glasgow. It's a brilliant idea to bring more attention to this as we come into the summer. Swadesh has benefited from the work AJ put in creating cooking videos and sharing recipes over the last few years. The connection to their regular customers has been maintained and they are making new friends. Ajay says, I'm Indian, but I'm grounded in Glasgow. It's my home city now. It excites me to have the feedback and know people are trying the recipes at home and then coming in for the full Swadesh experience. AJ is looking at sharing Indian barbecue recipes for summer and this spring he has been experimenting with his seasonal menu. He continues, My approach is Scottish produce led. I play with the flavours. I have game birds. You can have Indian tandoori wood pigeon, langoustines, lobster from sky, roe deer. The whole menu is looking fantastic and when people visit the restaurant they can enjoy the theatrical side of food. Park Lane Market on the south side takes place on the first and last Sunday of the month and is also part of the campaign. Co-founder Harry Oloranda says there is a wealth of new and existing small craft businesses and street food traders ready to show what they can do. He adds, we have built something here that's a creative space and we have added the market as a hub for creating a connection. There's a group of around 600 traders that are in the mix for future markets. The lineup changes and is added to. A collaboration with Ramon Dio on Ashton Lane will soon be added to the mix. Harry says, if someone has an idea, we can give them a platform. Deanston Bakery started off here and East Coffee in the East End began at the market. There are around 15 businesses that have grown from the market. I feel like there's a great vibe on the south side and that's what we are connected to. For me, it's about that community and the people. Report by Paul Trainer. This article is from the Glasgow Times, date 1st April 2022, from the Lifestyle section. Brayhead Centre to host Easter Egg Hunt with the Mad Hatter, by Esther Tarney. A shopping centre near Glasgow is inviting families for a special Easter Egg Hunt. Brayhead Centre is hosting Mad Hatter's Easter Egg Hunt between 12pm and 5pm from today until Monday, April 18th. The event starts at the Brayhead Boardwalk and encourages children to find six large eggs with puzzles to solve in the mall. They will then find a letter of the alphabet that makes up the password to enter the Mad Hatter's house. Participants will also get an Easter egg prize and £15 of vouchers to enjoy the rides at the family fun fair taking place on the boardwalk. Brayhead Centre Director Peter Beagley said, Our Mad Hatter's Easter egg hunt is all about families and friends having fun, so there's no need to worry about not being able to solve all the Easter egg puzzles. Between you and me, the answers and the password to get into the Mad Hatter's house are on the back of the guide. This is a great way for everyone to spend some quality time together over the Easter holidays. That article was by Esther Tarnay. This article is from The National, date 1st April 2022, from the Politics section. Free travel for Scotland's children this weekend as ScotRail returns to public ownership by Craig Meehan. Up to four children will be able to travel for free on ScotRail trains with every adult this weekend as the rail franchise comes back into public ownership. 
To celebrate the transition, children will be able to ride the trains for free on Saturday and Sunday if accompanied by a fee-paying adult. On Friday, the franchise transfers from Dutch firm Abilio into public ownership. Abilio has been running ScotRail since 2015, but it has faced criticism over performance levels. Its contract has been brought to an end three years early, having been due to last until 2025. Transport Minister Jenny Gilroth said, bringing ScotRail passenger services under public control and ownership puts passengers and staff at the heart of Scotland's rail services. It's an historic occasion and one that marks a key milestone in our ambitious programme for government to support a greener, fairer Scotland. This is an opportunity to deliver a railway which is for the benefit of the people of Scotland and everyone who travels by rail, customers, staff and stakeholders, not shareholders. The national conversation that gets underway this spring will provide an opportunity for staff, passengers and communities to have their say in how we shape Scotland's railway and ScotRail in particular. To celebrate this transition under the banner It's Yours to Use, we're providing free travel on April 2nd and 3rd for up to four children with every fair paying adult. We are encouraging everyone who can travel by rail this weekend to show our pride in Scotland's railway and our support for those who work hard to operate it on daily, a daily basis. Timetables will remain the same as planned and train livery is not changing, though the word Abelio will be removed from signs and printed materials. A publicly owned company called Scott Rail Trains Limited will operate train services, overseen by a public body called Scottish Rail Holdings. That article was by Craig Meehan. This article is from The National. Date 1st April 2022, from the Culture section. Historic Scottish sites reopen this month. Our top seven picks. By Anita Badani. Major Scottish sites of historical interest are set to open their doors to visitors once more this April. A 4,000 year old cairn, the tower which inspired Sir Walter Scott and the former home to Scottish engineer James Watt are among the historic sites that will be reopening across Scotland for the spring and summer. Historic Environment reopened over 70% of its estate last year. However, some of the sites had remained closed during the COVID-19 pandemic. Reopening these sites means the visitors will once again be able to take a peek behind the doors. Take a look below to see just some of the sites set to open their doors once more. Cairn Papal Hill. Lying in the Bathgate Hills, this Neolithic ceremonial site was a significant site for ceremonies and burials for at least 4,000 years. Its henge dates from about 3,800 BC. Visitors can stroll to the summit of the hill and take in awe-inspiring views across the Forth Valley. Reopening date, 1st April. Smalem Tower. Take a visit to the isolated tower house which inspired Sir Walter Scott. The four-storey tower house remains roofed and floored. Over the border in Northumberland, visitors can spot Bamburgh Castle from its battlements. Reopening date, 1st April. Spinney Palace. The largest surviving medieval bishop's house in Scotland, the Spinney Palace was residence to the bishops of Murray for 500 years. Royalty often used the palace as a guest house during their travels. Reopening date, 3rd April. Hermitage Castle. Known as the guard house of the bloodiest valley in Britain, this isolated castle, located in the midst of Scottish wilderness, is steeped in history and intrigue. The castle was targeted for 400 years for its role in controlling the Scottish Middle March. Reopening date, 19th April. 
Turfichen Perceptory. Founded by David I in the 1100s, this high tower and remains of the medieval headquarters of Scotland's Knights Hospitaller is rich in wonder. Here, pilgrims visiting the Holy Land were sheltered and protected. Reopening date, 19th April. Jarlshof Prehistoric and Norse Settlement With over 4,000 years of human settlement to its name, Neolithic people first settled in this Shetland site around 2700 BC. It remained in use until AD 1600s. Visitors can see the Iron Age Broch and wheelhouses at the site's location overlooking the West Foe of Sumbara. Reopening date, 21st April. Keneal House. From occupying the Romans to the Industrial Revolution, this house is steeped in 2,000 years of history. It is credited as the birthplace of the improved steam engine, Scott's engineer, James Watt, who developed his first engine here in the 1700s. Reopening date, 24th April. That article was by Anita Badani. Glasgow Times News on Monday the 4th of April. EasyJet cancels more than 200 flights with more to follow today. An article written by Emma Sabliak, digital reporter. Travellers are set to face disruption throughout this week after staff absences saw EasyJet cancel more than 200 flights. The airline blamed the problems on high levels of sickness amid staff testing positive for COVID-19 after 222 trips were axed over the weekend. At least 62 flights have been cancelled by the airline today, with flights from Scotland also being affected by the travel chaos. EasyJet said it had made efforts to offset staff shortages by rostering additional standby crew on the weekend, but was still forced to make additional cancellations over Sunday and Monday. An EasyJet spokesperson said, as a result of the current high levels of Covid infections across Europe, like all businesses, EasyJet is experiencing higher than usual levels of employee sickness. We've taken action to mitigate this through the rostering of additional standby crew this weekend. However, with the current levels of sickness, we've also decided to make some cancellations in advance, which were focused on consolidating flights where we have multiple frequencies, so customers have more options to rebook their travel, often on the same day. Unfortunately, it's been necessary to make some additional cancellations for today and tomorrow. We're sorry for any inconvenience this may cause to customers on affected flights. We've made 62 preemptive cancellations for flights to and from the UK for tomorrow, which represents a small proportion of tomorrow's total flying programme, which was planned to be more than 1,645 flights. We cancelled the majority of these yesterday. This comes as many families set off to airports as the Easter holidays got underway, with long queues affecting some major airports such as Heathrow. The airport attributed the congestion to Covid checks required by destination countries and high passenger volumes. But there were also reports of staff shortages and problems with the e-gate passport checkpoints as travellers took to social media to air their frustrations, with some saying they'd waited hours to take off. Other travellers said several of the automatic e-gates, staffed by border force and used to process passengers, were not operating properly. The Home Office confirmed there'd been a technical issue with the checkpoints, which has since been resolved, and said the problem had not caused queues to exceed their standard length at Heathrow. But a Heathrow spokesperson said, due to high passenger volumes and the Covid documentation checks still required by many end destinations, Terminal 2 departures have experienced some congestion today. Our teams are supporting our airline partners to get passengers away on their journeys as quickly as possible, and we apologise for any inconvenience this has caused. An article written by Emma Sabliak. Glasgow Times News on Monday the 4th of April. First class stamp price rises by 10 pence to 95 pence. An article written by Lois McKenzie, SEO journalist. Effective from today, the price of first class stamps has risen by 10 pence to 95 pence. The cost of second class stamps has also changed, rising by 2 pence to 69 pence. The Royal Mail has said there's been a decline in letter usage over time, as well as rising inflation. Letter volumes have fallen by more than 60% since their peak in 2004-2005, and by around 20% since the start of the pandemic. Nick Landon, Chief Commercial Officer at Royal Mail, said, 
We understand that many companies and households are finding it hard in the current economic environment and we'll always keep our prices as affordable as possible. Whilst the number of letters our postmen and women deliver has declined from around 20 billion a year to around 7 billion since 2004-2005, the number of addresses they have to deliver to has grown by around 3.5 million in the same period. We need to carefully balance our pricing against declining letter volumes and increasing costs of delivering to a growing number of addresses six days a week. As customer needs change and we see a greater shift from letters to parcels, it's vital that the universal service adapts to stay relevant and sustainable. These price changes are necessary to ensure we can continue to maintain and invest in the one price goes anywhere universal service for future generations. Unite General Secretary Sharon Graham said, The Royal Mail boardroom is again raising prices while helping itself to massive profits. It's behaving like a short-term greedy speculator rather than the responsible owner of a key UK public service. With plans to slash 900 postal manager jobs and threats issued to Unite that collective bargaining agreements for our members will be ignored, Royal Mail's owners are ruining this essential service. Ofgem has to get a grip because the universal service obligation is at serious risk. Unite's postal managers are at the heart of this service and our union will back them all the way in this fight to protect jobs and services. An article written by Lois McKenzie. Glasgow Times News on Monday the 4th of April. Airbnb flat owners in city lose appeal against bid to stop lets. An article written by Drew Sandilands. The owners of a Glasgow Airbnb flat in Tradeston, which neighbours complained was disruptive, have lost an appeal against the council order to stop letting the property. A resident in the block of flats at Carnoustie Street reported the use of the apartment as short-stay accommodation was unsettling and at times threatening, with allegations of drug use by guests. Council officials investigating the complaint decided planning rules had been breached and told the landlord to cease using the property as a holiday let. Failure to comply can lead to prosecution or a fine. But the owners, Rona Lamont and Andrew McKinnon, appealed to Scottish ministers. They claimed letters from the council had been sent to the wrong address and the short-term let complied with planning guidance. However, an independent reporter, Trevor Croft, appointed by the Scottish Government, has now upheld the original decision. The Carnoustie Street flat was advertised on Airbnb as a spacious and stunning three-bed duplex penthouse-style apartment within minutes' walk of Glasgow City Centre, the Hydro and the SECC. It offered accommodation for up to eight guests, with three bedrooms and six beds, at around £150 per night, plus an additional service and cleaning fee. Council officials told Mr Croft that a resident complained the short-term use is disruptive, unsettling and at times threatening, having different people staying every night and being regularly confronted with total strangers within the close, in what should be a secure block. The council submission to the reporter added, their own property has been the subject of unsolicited visits by persons attempting to gain entry to the subject property. Furthermore, there have been several instances where large numbers of people, more than ten, have used what is a three-bedroom flat suitable for a maximum of six people. There have been alleged instances of drug misuse, leading to further anxiety from the complainant. Officials decided that as the whole flat was available as short-stay accommodation and it's considered the property is in frequent use as a holiday let, then a material change of use has occurred, which would require planning permission. Council guidance states approval would not be granted for a change of use from a residential flat to short-stay accommodation within existing blocks of residential flats, where the flats and holiday lets share a means of access. The council made several attempts to contact the owners of the property to resolve the planning breach informally, but no response was received, therefore enforcement action was necessary. The owners claimed that the enforcement letter was posted through the wrong mailbox, meaning they did not have the full 28 days to digest the notice. We're aware of no previous communications from the planning authority, they told the reporter. This is not a typical residential block. The 28 individual properties within this block each have at least two main entry or exit points, their own front and back door. The reporter, Mr Croft, appointed by Scottish ministers, said he was in no doubt that a change of use had occurred. He said, I'm satisfied there's been a breach of planning control. 
While it may be that some envelopes were inadvertently delivered to the wrong address, they still reached the appellants in time for them to consider the notice and issue the appeal. I find that the appellants were not, therefore, prejudiced by any wrong delivery. Mr Croft added the noise and disturbance appears to relate mainly to one- and two-night lets. The Council notes that amenity problems arise where short-stay service departments are intermingled within blocks of flats, as is the case here. I find the only way to overcome this is to return the property to mainstream residential use. An article written by Drew Sandilands. Glasgow Times News on Monday the 4th of April. Glasgow mum sobs after baby gets a helmet to reshape severely deformed skull. An exclusive front page article written by Kirsty Fierick, senior reporter. A Glasgow mum sobbed after her baby finally got a helmet to reshape her severely deformed skull. Tracy Mulholland Cairns is over the moon that her little girl is now receiving treatment for her plagiocephaly and brachycephaly deformity. The condition means the seven months old tot's head is flat and misshapen, leaving her mum worried she could be bullied. The 40-year-old felt like a terrible mother when she first couldn't pay the huge £3,000 bill to buy the Tim Band helmet which would correct the deformity. It comes as the device which acts as a brace to gently reshape Remy's head isn't available on the NHS because it's seen as cosmetic. But after feeling hopeless, Tracy from Easter House was blown away when her community rallied round and chipped in almost £7,000 to buy the helmet. Now Remy is wearing it 23 hours a day and her family hopes she won't need a second one due to the severity of her condition. Tracy said, I cried when she first put it on. It was a relief going from feeling hopeless to actually seeing it on her. It was happy tears and she does look so cute. So far she's been okay, a little bit crabbit, but as it's for the best we need to persevere. We had to gradually build up wearing time to 23 hours a day with a one hour break. She may need a second helmet due to growth and the severity of her condition. The money raised will cover those costs as well. Tracy's fundraising efforts, which raked in thousands, smashing their £3,000 target, are now being used to help other children secure helmets for the same condition. She's been overwhelmed by the support from fellow Glaswegians, but has also seen donations come in from across the globe. Now she hopes to continue raising money for babies like Remy and is even raffling a Rangers signed top for the cause. Tracy said, The love and support from the people of Glasgow and my wee community has been phenomenal. I'm so happy we got there with the help of our fellow Glaswegians. We even received a donation from someone in Orlando, Florida, with a lovely message. Remy also got personally gifted money from all the lovely ladies at Connect Community Trust Bingo in Proven Hall, and we're taking her for her first ever wee caravan break, thanks to them. Remy has made a little friend called Buddy Rob. Her fund helped with his deposit for a helmet. Now he has reached his target as well through his mummy fundraising. I've just been so overwhelmed by everyone's kindness and how the community really came to support me. They've really taken the pressure off, which I'm eternally grateful for. I really can't believe how much they've done for me. An exclusive article written by Kirsty Fierick. Glasgow Times News on Monday the 4th of April. Majority of men would consider male contraceptive pill, a survey shows. An article written by Jamie Jones, SEO journalist. A male contraceptive pill is set to be trialled in humans later this year as a new survey reveals more than half of UK men might be inclined to take it. There have already been a number of different types of the male pill but none has proved as popular as the female equivalent. An early version contained only synthetic progesterone and required the use of an implant that releases testosterone to counter any unwanted effects. More recently, a couple of oral contraceptive pills for men have been through early successful trials in the United States. One pill is called 11-beta-MNDTC and works by blocking sperm production. In a small trial, it caused the hormones required for sperm production to drop, and some men experienced side effects such as acne, fatigue and headaches. Some men reported low sex drive and erectile difficulties, but none of the participants stopped the trial due to the side effects. However, the latest variation has been shown to be 99% effective at preventing pregnancy in mice, with no side effects. As the march towards a male contraceptive pill comes closer, 
Lloyd's Pharmacy Online Doctor conducted a UK-based survey to find out if men were willing to use it once on the market. The survey showed 58% will consider using the male contraceptive pill, with 42% saying they wouldn't. Currently, the only two options for male birth control are male condoms or a vasectomy. At the time of writing, trials are underway for various male birth control methods, but it isn't clear when these methods would be approved and made available on the NHS. Any new medication has to be rigorously tested and trialled to make sure it's safe and effective for as many people as possible, which is why it's taking a long time. In the meantime, couples who want to avoid pregnancy should make sure that they're using at least one form of reliable contraception. An article written by Jamie Jones. Glasgow Times News on Monday the 4th of April. Plans for Baltic Street cleansing depot staff to relocate unveiled at council meeting. An article written by Catherine Hunter, local democracy reporter. Staff at the Glasgow East End Council cleansing depot will be relocated as plans to transfer the site into the ownership of a local housing association move forward. During Glasgow's full council meeting this week, it was revealed that an in-principle agreement to move the Baltic Street depot land into the ownership of a housing association had been reached. It comes as Conservative councillor Robert Connolly asked for an update on the Dilmarnock depot's future. Councillor Kenny McLean said an in-principle agreement has been reached with a local housing association that the ground upon which the Baltic Street depot is located will be transferred to the housing association for them to deliver on their housing master plan for this area. Local staff are fully aware of the intended use of the site going forward. However, relocation of staff will not take place until suitable alternative operational arrangements have been made for the activities that operate out of the depot. Staff will be kept informed with developments and timescales associated with the relocation of the Baltic Street depot. Councillor Connolly said that many residents and workers at the depot had raised concerns about its future. He said, To actually hear that it's going to be closing at some point in the future will be very worrying for those workers and the residents in Dilmarnock. I would ask that workers are kept informed so they know what's happening. The workers and residents I've spoken to will not be happy with the depot closing. Councillor McLean responded, I hear what Councillor Connolly is saying, but as I said, staff and locals are being fully informed of what is happening. We're currently undertaking a depot review and spending £20 million to bring them up to standard. This is in pursuit of providing quality and affordable housing in the area. An article written by Catherine Hunter. Glasgow Times News on Monday the 4th of April. Presenter insists racism in Scotland is getting worse. An article written by Catherine Bussey. Television presenter Jean Johansson has spoken out about facing racism in Scotland, insisting that the problem is getting worse. Ms Johansson, a reporter for BBC's The One Show and a presenter on both Animal Park and A Place in the Sun, recalled her experiences growing up in Scotland in the 1980s and 1990s, revealing she was spat at in the face as a 17-year-old. But speaking in a BBC documentary, Disclosure, the Truth About Scotland and Racism, she said, When I compare what I heard to my upbringing in the 80s and 90s, I can honestly say things are getting worse. The presenter, who was born in Port Glasgow, said she had known doing the show would stir up all kinds of emotions and force me to not only face my past, but confront the present-day reality for people who look like me. She added... I approach the project from a place of privilege in terms of my lifestyle, job, profile and the circumstances. I now realise these things have shielded me from what's really going on around me and the reality for people who look like me. I've had my eyes opened. It's not the Scotland I grew up in. I don't have all the answers, but from the people I've spoken to, I think education is the key and allyship and community are incredibly important. Nazam Mir, Professor of Race Identity and Citizenship at the University of Edinburgh, told the programme that while about a third of people from black and ethnic minorities in Scotland say they routinely experience racial discrimination, about 60% of the people who say they have experienced racial discrimination haven't reported it to any kind of authority. Professor Mir stated, Poverty is a really good example of the issue of ethnic and racial disparities in Scotland. So while only making up about 4% of the Scottish population, black and ethnic minorities make up 11% of the population of people deemed to be living in poverty. 
and that's the number which is actually getting higher. Meanwhile, Edinburgh University Rector Deborah Kayambi told the show, the more I go further up into the society, the more racism gets worse. Disclosure, the truth about Scotland and racism, will be broadcast tonight at 8 o'clock on BBC One Scotland. An article written by Catherine Bussey. Glasgow Times News. On Monday the 4th of April. Publicly owned ScotRail could scrap peak fares, says Minister. An article written by Andrew Learmonth, journalist. Newly nationalised ScotRail could scrap peak time fares and bring in free travel for young people, the Transport Minister has said. The Scottish train service moved into public ownership on Friday after seven years under Dutch state transport firm Abellio. Speaking to the BBC's Sunday show, Jenny Gilruth said it was a real opportunity to deliver a railway which is for the benefit of its users, not for shareholders. And she said peak fares were on the table as the new company looked at how to get passengers back onto the railway. The minister said that the number of people using trains in Scotland was at around 60% of where it was before the pandemic. Some of that relates to affordability and some of that relates to people still having anxiety in terms of returning to public transport. We've taken action to keep fares down and ScotRail fares are still on average 20% cheaper than those across the rest of Great Britain. However, we do think that we need to look at that again, which is why our Fair Fares review offers us that opportunity to consider affordability on the railways, but also, I think, to incentivise people coming back to rail. To mark the first weekend of public ownership, children aged 5 to 15 were allowed to travel for free. Ms Gilruth said that that was something that could become permanent as the new company considers different opportunities to use our fare structure to better incentivise people coming back to rail. She said that's a really encouraging move from government to show that we can be flexible in terms of our fare approach, but also I think that a further look into the future with regards to affordability is something that we absolutely shouldn't rule out, and that's why our fare fares will consider affordability on the railway in detail. Ms Gilruth said, There are a number of challenges here. We've spoken about patronage and we've spoken about affordability now. And one of the things we're also doing is, of course, increasing the timetable allocations. So from May, there will be 150 extra services. I think it's important to remember that rail patronage right across the network is sitting at around 60% of what it was before the pandemic. And we also know that more people are choosing to travel at weekends now, as opposed to during the week. So we need to look at things like, for example, peak fares and whether or not that's reflective actually of working practices now with more people deciding to work from home as a result of the pandemic. So these things should all be on the table. But I fundamentally think that it's really important the public have the opportunity to shape the vision for ScotRail as we move forward with public ownership. Ms Gilruth also said there was conversation to be had around carriages. We also, I think, need to look at carriage provision, so we need to build in the opportunity for people to space out, for example, if they want to do so, and we need to make sure that people feel safe fundamentally moving back to rail. I have meetings with British Transport Police this week around how we can better facilitate that. We'll be working with colleagues, of course, in ScotRail and across the Network Rail network to ensure that people do feel safe to return but also we consider the fare structure and how we can better incentivise people choosing to return. Speaking later on the same programme, Conservative Transport spokesman Graeme Simpson said the party wasn't against nationalisation. It could work, but what we need to hear from the Transport Minister, and what we certainly didn't hear earlier, is what she actually plans to do. He added, she wants to have a conversation. I can tell her she doesn't need to have a conversation because what people will tell her is they need lower fares. She needs to look at lowering fares so that they're more affordable. We need a simpler fare system and also we need that smart card that we've been talking about for years that they managed to give to COP26 delegates, but what about the rest of us? Labour leader Anna Sawa said it was good that ScotRail was back in public hands. What people want to see is cheaper rail, trains to come on time and more services available. At the moment, what we're seeing is rail fares going up. We're seeing ticket offices closing or reducing their hours. We're seeing routes cut. That's not a better service for people across Scotland. That's a worse service. He said better services, services that come on time, more options with your services and lower fares would get more people onto the railways and increase ScotRail's income and pay for many of the changes people expect to see. Abellio has been running the franchise since 2015 but had its contract ended early amid criticism over cancellation and performance levels. 
all ScotRail staff will transfer to the new Scottish Government-owned entity. A new company called ScotRail Trains Limited will run services overseen by Scottish Rail Holdings Limited, a new public body controlled by the Scottish Government. An article written by Andrew Laymonth. Glasgow Times News on Monday the 4th of April. South Lanarkshire Council scraps all library fines. An article written by Shannon Milmean, local democracy reporter. South Lanarkshire Leisure and Culture is scrapping library fines in a bid to encourage people to use the facilities. The cancellation of fines will begin on Friday the 8th and apply at all libraries, and this includes existing fines. South Lanarkshire Leisure and Culture's General Manager, Kay Morrison, said, We hope people will see this as an opportunity to reconnect with their library. With the cost of living crisis impacting on so many people's finances, we recognised another cost, although small is the last thing that anyone needs. So if you have books gathering dust on your shelf, why not return them and start borrowing again? Our libraries are fantastic places to borrow books, learn or just relax and enjoy the surroundings. Those who live, work or study in South Lanarkshire can make use of the 23 libraries which all have free Wi-Fi access and a home delivery service. People can also discover history and heritage of their local area, as well as researching family trees at the libraries in the area. The active IT computer learning centres also allow visitors to use the internet, email friends or family and even pick up new skills. An article written by Shannon Milmean. From the Glasgow Times, Tuesday the 5th of April 2022. From the news section. Beat the squeeze. UK government says it's committed to ending poverty. The UK government said it is committed to ending poverty and said it is putting more money into workers' pockets. The Glasgow Times, as part of our Beat the Squeeze series, challenged the government to do more to help people struggling with the cost of living crisis. We asked a series of questions from pay to benefits and pensions. We also asked the Scottish Government to act using its powers. We directed our questions to the Treasury, who passed it on to the Department for Work and Pensions, who responded. We asked if pensioners can be guaranteed the triple lock will be restored in 2023, if workers can be assured the national insurance rise will only be for one year, also if people on benefits will see an uplift of more than 3.1% when inflation is around double that, and if the government will lift the benefits cap as requested by a group of charities led by Poverty Alliance. It said the benefits cap will remain, and it is committed to restoring the triple lock on pensions next year. A UK government spokesperson said, We recognise the pressures people are facing with the cost of living, which is why we are providing support worth £22 billion across the next financial year. This includes putting an average of £1,000 more per year into the pockets of working families via changes to universal credit, cutting fuel duty and helping households with their energy bills. We're also boosting the minimum wage by more than £1,000 a year for full-time workers and raising national insurance thresholds so people keep more of what they earn, while our £1 billion household support fund is helping the most vulnerable with essential costs. Meanwhile, the Scottish Parliament has significant welfare powers and can top up existing benefits, pay discretionary payments and create entirely new benefits in areas of devolved responsibility. It listed other actions and what it saw as current policies existing help. In additional information included with the response, the government said, We are committed to ending poverty and are putting more money in the pockets of hard-working families, which is why this year we provided a pay rise to 2 million of the UK's lowest paid through a higher minimum wage. It claimed universal credit was making people better off. Adding, our changes to universal credit will see nearly 2 million working claimants better off by around £1,000 a year while our plan for jobs is supporting more people into employment. The changes to the UC taper rate and work allowance should see 1.9 million working families on universal credit gain an average of approximately £1,000 per annum. A £1 billion household support fund, it added, is helping the most vulnerable with essential costs, 
including £35 million in supporting schools in disadvantaged areas to provide breakfasts to those who need it, and it said, our holiday activities and food programme is providing healthy food and enriching activities to disadvantaged children. The government, which was urged by a number of charities to lift the benefits cap, said the benefit cap up to the equivalent salary of 24,000k balances fairness for taxpayers with providing a vital safety net. This article was by Stuart Patterson. From the Glasgow Times, Tuesday the 5th of April 2022, from the news section. Beat the squeeze. Full-time working couples struggle to rent one bed flat in Glasgow as cost of living soars. A young couple who both work full time are struggling to rent a one bedroom flat in Glasgow as the cost of living soars. Andrew Fry and his partner, who doesn't want to be named, have been left worrying about where they will live as their energy bills are set to skyrocket. The two young professionals, both aged 24, want to leave their £800 a month two bedroom flat in Partick as it has no insulation or double glazed windows, leaving them hit hard with heating bills. It comes after a UK government decision to increase the energy fuel cap by a whopping 54%, leaving millions of people scrambling to find a way to survive. The pair have now decided to downsize to a one bedroom flat in a similar area to save money, but were shocked to find prices are the same or higher for smaller properties. Andrew said, It just feels like an impossible task. We both work full-time and it is still hard to rent a one-bedroom flat. Our flat isn't energy sufficient. We have said to the landlord that our energy prices are going up, which is a huge increase in our cost of living, but they don't have plans to add double glazing or insulation. They know they can fill the flat fast and maybe even put the price up if they like, so why would they bother to improve it for us? We have been looking for something else, But the prices landlords are asking are so unreasonable, they know they can get away with it because there is such a high demand. People are charging more than £800 for a small flat that hasn't seen so much as a lick of paint since 1995, and it is accepted because that is just the standard. Andrew is hoping they can find a flat soon that will allow them to cover their soaring heating bills. It comes as their estimated monthly spend in winter was around 90 but now Shell Energy have recommended they pay 230. The pair are also hoping to buy their own property in the future, but admitted it feels like a fantasy idea as they try to keep afloat in the cost of living crisis. Andrew said, it isn't hard to see how people fall into homelessness or hard times. I work hard, but it would only take me not being paid for about two months for me to fall into serious trouble. It is easy for people to slip under, It can happen to anyone, and with bills going up to much more, people are at risk. We would love to buy our own property, but even though we both work full-time, it seems like a fantasy idea. How could we ever do that with rent increasing and housing bills going up? It would be impossible. I don't have high hopes of things getting any better anytime soon. With the war in Ukraine, Covid and energy bills going up, we need a break and some serious help. This article was by... Kirsty Fierig. From the Glasgow Times of Tuesday the 5th of April 2022, from the opinion section, The Green View, John Molyneux, Glasgow always deserves better. Nominations are in and we've had the last full council meeting before the local elections. The campaign is now well and truly underway. I'm pleased that everyone in Glasgow will have the opportunity to make Glasgow greener and fairer by voting for their local Scottish Green candidate. The election on May the 5th will inevitably, for some, be about passing judgment on how the city has been run over the past five years. Declining levels of trust in the council and diminishing confidence in the quality of council services are serious concerns. But it is incumbent on political parties to do more than just point out the problems. We have to also offer solutions. We must create a vision for people of how things can change and demonstrate why we can be trusted to deliver that change. Glasgow always deserves better. 
We must never stop striving for that. I'm proud that over the past five years, my Green colleagues and I have consistently put forward our ideas for what a better, greener and fairer Glasgow looks like. More than that, we've also worked hard to actually make those things happen, whether that's securing a 2030 net zero carbon target for the city, which was initially opposed by the SNP, or securing millions for investment in play parks, tenement repairs, recycling and green spaces. Having spent the best part of 18 months supporting library readings, first at Pollock Shields Library and then with the Save the Cooper campaign, I'm personally most pleased that Greens ensured the funding to reopen all of the city's libraries, not that some parties seem to want to mislead people on a one-year basis, but with guaranteed baselined funding. This will be further boosted by the £1.8 million we agreed in the current council budget to fund the reopening of community centres and the much-loved St Mungo's Museum and Province Lordship. We owe a huge thank you to all the local library campaigns and the local and national media outlets which got behind them too. Political leadership on this issue came from our communities and it's right that we respond to that, not just in reopening the libraries, but also ensuring they have a positive future at the heart of our local neighbourhoods. That's why at the council meeting on Thursday, Scottish Green councillors brought a motion committing the next administration to a refresh of the city's vision for libraries. We want to celebrate and harness the energy of local campaigns and promote the potential for libraries as local climate action hubs and spaces for people to live better locally as we move out of the pandemic. Our green vision for libraries imagines them as part of a more sharing and collaborative society. There are fantastic examples of tool and toy libraries, repair networks and other sharing services that we could have in all our local areas, reducing how much we consume, tackling the cost of living and building communities. We can draw a clear line between the need for high quality, inclusive, accessible community venues and tackling the climate emergency, which is the existential crisis of our age. I think that's an exciting vision for our libraries, and it's one that with more green councillors elected on May the 5th, we will make an absolute unwavering priority. This article was by John Molyneux. From the Glasgow Times, Tuesday the 5th of April 2022, from the news section. Man in hospital after crashing car trying to evade police in Mary Hill, North Glasgow. By Esther Tarney. A man was taken to hospital after he drove away from police officers and crashed his car. Police Scotland confirmed that they were called to a disturbance at Balmore Road in Mary Hill just after 7pm on Sunday the 4th of April. The incident involved two men and one of them drove away after the officers arrived. After fleeing, the 24-year-old crashed his car and was taken to hospital. An investigation was launched. A Police Scotland spokesperson said, Around 7.10pm on Sunday 4th April 2022, police attended Balmore Road, Mary Hill, following a report of a disturbance involving two men. As officers attended, one man got into a car and drove off. Shortly thereafter, police located the vehicle which had crashed approximately two miles from the initial location. The 24-year-old male was taken to hospital and inquiries are ongoing. That article was by Esther Tarney. From the Glasgow Times, Tuesday the 5th of April 2022, from the news section. Man's head stomped on in brawl at Glasgow Soup Kitchen by Katrina Stewart. A man stomped on another's head during an unprovoked attack at a Glasgow soup kitchen. Christopher McLees was one of three people who launched an assault 
on victim William Graham at the service under the Healand man's umbrella. Glasgow Sheriff Court was told how on May the 25th last year at around 8.50 p.m. Mr Graham and McLeese were both at the soup kitchen as were another man and a woman. The woman was engaged in a heated conversation with Mr Graham when she began punching him on his head, hitting him several times and causing him to fall to the ground. The other man was watching this unfold and stepped in, also attacking him and knocking him back to the ground when he stood up. The woman continued punching him as he lay on the pavement. At this point, McLees of Summerston intervened and then carried on what the court heard was an unprovoked attack on Mr Graham, tripping him up and causing him to fall again. McLees, 35, then stomped on Mr Graham's head several times before walking away. Mr Graham got up, but McLees returned and continued punching him to the, the head. The brawl was caught on CCTV and camera operators contacted police, who arrived at the scene and found McLees on Hope Street while his co-accused was found on Wellington Street. Mr Graham was taken to Glasgow Royal Infirmary, where he was treated for cuts to his face. McLees' defence brief told the court there had been an earlier incident between some of the parties and his clients were responding to that. Sheriff Jonathan Guy said he wished to view the CCTV footage of the incident, which required deferring sentencing. The case will call again on April 29th. This article was by Katrina Stewart. From the Glasgow Times of Tuesday the 5th of April 2022, from the opinion section, Politicians Should Feel the Shame of Poverty by Katrina Stewart. The picture shows derelict housing in the east end of Glasgow. For many years I shared a bedroom with my mum. It was a council flat and had two bedrooms, but my bedroom, the smaller one, was so damp as to be uninhabitable. Really, the flat itself was uninhabitable and eventually, after ten years there, we were decanted and the block demolished to be replaced by front and back door houses. When we first moved in, my mum hired a painter and decorator to do the place up. My bedroom had an oblong window that took up nearly the width of the room. When the tradesman peeled the paper off, the wall underneath the window began to crumble. I remember staring for a long time at this curiosity. You could see the grass outside. We had lived in many properties in several countries, but never before had I encountered see-through walls. It was so damp that the wall had been held up by layer upon layer of wallpaper. There were bits of wall in my bedroom that swelled out like blisters, and you could push your finger into the lumpy bulges to hear the loose brick crackle. Other bits of wall were wet where damp bloomed and speckled. The bathroom had mould that could never be vanquished with cleaning materials and mushrooms grew up through the kitchen floor. I'm not sure if they were edible. We never chanced it. Other friends in other council flats dealt too with damp and mould and for a very long time I thought that damp housing was normal. I almost never talk about this, and recently I was thinking about why. Shame, really, is the answer. Not my shame in particular, but my poor mum's shame. She would be mortified to think that people knew we lived in substandard council housing. There are a great many more details I could give about that flat, but as a compromise I'll go only so far as the mushrooms. But isn't it silly that the shame is ours, rather than the shame being that of the local authority, the landlord allowing its tenants to live in such dire, dire surroundings? Poverty and shame go hand in hand. Who wants to admit that they aren't providing for their child what other parents can provide? Who wants to admit to hard times and stretched funds? Or, as is increasingly the case, no funds at all. We've come a long way since the tabloid tales of single mums on benefits being scorned for sponging enough free money to afford ten children and a flat screen TV. 
But the myths of and shame at poverty still cling. Now, though, after a confluence of circumstances, we are seeing a change in how we view people who are struggling. During the pandemic, community volunteers covered over the cracks caused by gaps in the social safety net. A focus on local people helping in their local areas, neighbours pitching in for neighbours, gave a much better understanding of the situations of others. Swiftly following the pandemic is the cost of living crisis, a neat phrase that sums up the issue without giving a face or a voice to the people living through the worst of it. Suddenly everyone is affected by price hikes and energy increases. Even from middle class families with savings and steady work there is panicked talk of cutting back, down and out. Those who can still make ends meet with a bit of cost cutting are the lucky ones. We still talk about the choice between heating or eating. But this choice is a fallacy. Standing charges are now so high that people will still be paying massively increased costs for the daily charges, even without running appliances or having the heating on. The choice is more eating or staying connected to the grid which is factual but far less snappy. Essentially, people who can very least afford it will be accruing debt but having absolutely nothing to show for it. Millions are to be plunged into poverty thanks to the choices of this current government. People who always assumed they would be financially okay will start to struggle. For a long time, poverty was seen as going hand in hand with laziness and fecklessness rather than the truth, which is that some people are lucky and other people are not. Fortune, fickle fortune, smiles where she likes. The pandemic and now the cost of living crisis show that circumstance is very often a matter of whim and that anyone can be at risk of losing what they have built. This insight is valuable because a united front is vital. Politicians shy away from increasing benefits because they worry about spooking voters who still believe that the benefits system exists to keep layabouts in ready meals and fags. Many more of us are vulnerable now and that vulnerability should bring with it a sharp change in attitude from poverty as failure of character to the reality that poverty is not the shame of the individual but a collective shame of failed political systems. This article was by Katrina Stewart. From the Glasgow Times, Wednesday the 6th of April 2022. From the news section, exclusive, Glasgow families heartbreak over dad's cancer death. By Nicol Mitchell A heartbroken wife has urged people to make sure their doctors listen to them after losing her beloved husband to cancer. John Carini, who lived in Springburn, passed away from the stage 4 lung cancer last month, on Tuesday March 8th, after he was diagnosed with the disease in November. His devastated wife Karen is now begging people to ensure their doctors listen to them after she claims it took 8 months and five visits to her GP surgery for the 52 year old to be diagnosed. She said, he'd went saying he thought he maybe had muscle pain in his left hand side and the doctor said it's probably a muscle strain and told him to keep taking his painkillers. He was already on painkillers for a disability he had for his back and leg and they said it would probably go away. Karen says the father of two visited the surgery again another three times as the pain got worse and, despite asking for a chest x-ray, was referred to physiotherapy, prescribed antibiotics for a chest infection, and told to keep taking his painkillers. In November, she claims he visited the practice for the fifth time and was then sent for same-day tests by the doctor. Karen said, She said, I'd like to send you down to Glasgow Royal Infirmary to have some tests done. And he was kept in from that night. He had various bloods done. He had a scan done and they said they were going to wait until the next morning to do a CT scan just so it would be more in-depth. 
It was on November 19th that it was confirmed it was stage 4 lung cancer and, bless him, he, he was told himself because no one was allowed to go in with him. Karen said, We were so angry and confused as to why he specifically asked to go for a chest x-ray that they never sent him. It was at least three different doctors that he'd seen and not one of them would even just send him for a scan or an x-ray. Nothing. They just kept wanting to throw tablets at him or something like physiotherapy. Although John had his disabilities and things, he was never a complainer. He always just thought, ach, I'll be fine. He wasn't one for taking lots of medication. So when John was asking me to make an appointment for the doctors, that's when we thought, right, something must be wrong with him. He knows his own body. Just 10 days after John's diagnosis, the family received more devastating news when his 30-year-old nephew Ryan died from a heart attack. Karen said, That was a massive blow to him because he was so close to Ryan. He was almost like a father figure for him. To be told he had cancer one week and his nephew dying the next week, it was just a massive, massive blow. And then the following week, that was when John was told that he'd basically been put in palliative care because there was nothing really they could do. John underwent radiotherapy in December before starting chemotherapy in January. His second chemotherapy session was postponed until the end of February due to a chest infection, but following treatment, he was taken into Glasgow Royal Infirmary on March 2nd. He died in hospital on March 8th, just two days before his 53rd birthday. Karen said, Doctors need to listen to people when they know their own body, and that's what's so hard. It's just so sad to be, t- for, to be taken this quickly, when this could have been avoided. I'm not saying it would have been, but it could have been avoided, or he could have had more time. After John's death, a GoFundMe was set up in his memory to raise money to help with funeral costs. So far, more than 40 donors have raised more than £840, and Karen says the family have been overwhelmed by people's kindness. Karen said, My son and daughter started the page along with their cousin, and honestly, the response, I cannot believe how kind-hearted and how nice and generous people are. Even kids from their school that they've not seen in years have been donating, friends that we've not seen, people I don't know, they've even donated and honestly, I cannot thank them enough. Everyone who's looked at that page and shared that page, I cannot thank them enough. We are so overwhelmed by the generosity and kindness of people and it just restores your faith in humanity just knowing that there are people out there willing to help. A spokesperson for the practice said, Our condolences go to Mr Crean's family and loved ones and what must have been a very difficult time. While we cannot comment on individual patients, we would be happy to meet with Mr Crean's family to discuss his care. You can view the GoFundMe page for John's funeral online. And that article was an exclusive by Nicole Mitchell. From the Glasgow Times, Wednesday the 6th of April 2022, from the news section. Glasgow planners reject bid to transform Finiston flats into short-term holiday lets. Report by Catherine Hunter. A bid to transform 42 residential flats in Finiston into short-term holiday lets has been rejected by Glasgow City Council's Planning Committee. An application to use the properties as short-stay serviced apartments at Minerva Way was described as appalling, with councillors stating the proposal was not suitable for the area. Around 100 letters of objection were submitted to the council from residents who were not informed prior to buying the property. A contract between the developer and Sondar had already been signed. They said that despite there not being any legal requirement to disclose this information, many residents would not have completed their purchase had they been informed about the plans. Concerns were also raised that the short-term lets would turn into party flats for tourists and would not be appropriate for this residential area of Finiston. The issue was discussed at the morning's planning meeting. SNP councillor Eva Bolander said, I am quite appalled to see the effort that the applicant has put into making this acceptable. There are a lot of very good reasons for it to be refused and I fully support that position. Bailey Josephine Doherty added, Finiston is different from its surrounding areas and I think it would be a pity to have far too many flats and houses to rent or to let people pass, passing people who really do not care or have any real identity of the area. I would like to see some slowing down of houses to rent or to lease and to keep the tradition of Finiston separate from the surrounding area. 
Members unanimously agreed to reject the application and the advice and information submitted to them by the council officers. After the meeting, Councillor Christy Mearns said, We do not need precedent for this, and I am pleased that short stay will not be supported here in favour of much needed housing. A victory for the community who engaged in the planning process to have their voices heard. Councillor Angus Miller said following the meeting that the committee made the right decision and the news will come as a relief to residents who oppose the plans. He said, This development was always unsuited for short-term lets, with an apart hotel style use clearly having an impact on neighbouring residents within the development. The short-term lets would have relied on permanent residents' common areas, including bins, car parking and access pend, and, while proposed on-site security until 1am was seemingly an effort to reassure residents, this only underlined the extent to which these proposals would have fundamentally altered the character of this residential complex. Ultimately, this proposal should never have gotten this far. Sonder was told early on that their plans were unlikely to be compatible with city planning policy, and only council enforcement action made them accept the need to even engage with the planning process. And it is completely unacceptable that residents were informed of these poorly thought through plans only after they bought to move into their new homes, despite evidence Sunder had been in talks about taking over the flats well before then. We need homes to help build communities in areas like Finiston, not party flats for tourists, and I'm pleased today's decision upholds the importance of protecting our new build housing supply for residential use. And that article was by Catherine Hunter. Evening Times, April 6th. Lifestyle. Glasgow's Forgotten Geniuses Celebrated in New Book Report by Anne Fotheringham If you were asked to name a Glasgow architect, Charles Rennie Macintosh is bound to be top of the list. Alexander Greek Thompson would probably get a mention too, but two of the city's most prolific and successful architects would likely be left out. And yet between them, John James Burnett and James Miller are responsible for some of Glasgow's most beautiful and well-known buildings. The George Square Cenotaph, Charing Cross Mansions, Glasgow Central Station and the Athenaeum, to name just a few. Little is known about Burnett and Miller, but thanks to a new book by John Stewart, that is about to change. The life and work of Glasgow architects James Miller and John James Burnett is the first biography of the two men to consider their work as a whole, and it is a fascinating insight into the wealth and success of Glasgow in the 19th and early 20th centuries. While born just three years apart, the men were raised in very different circumstances. Burnett was the son of a wealthy Glasgow architect and Miller grew up on a farm. Their careers and lives became intertwined as they competed for work and eventually the role of Scotland's leading architect. Born in 1857 and 1860 respectively, one inherited and the other established successful practices in Glasgow as it emerged as the second city of the empire. Burnett was the third son of John Burnett, a noted and self-taught architect whose works included Elgin Place Church, once described as the purest example of the neoclassic in Glasgow. He was educated at the highly exclusive Blair Lodge School in Polmont near Falkirk. It later became the site of a young offender's institution and at the prestigious École Nationale Supérieure des Beaux-Arts in Paris. After a grand tour of Europe, he returned to Glasgow and rose quickly through the ranks at his father's firm and he led his profession in Glasgow in the latter years of the 19th and early years of the 20th centuries. He produced many of the city's finest buildings, including the Athenaeum on Buchanan Street, 
the Alhambra, demolished in 1971, Charing Cross mansions, numerous city centre commercial buildings such as Waterloo Chambers and Atlantic Chambers, and the townhouses on University Avenue. After moving to London, his work included the extension of the British Museum, the Daily Telegraph building on Fleet Street, and the Adelaide House by London Bridge. Burnett, who died in July 1938, was knighted and awarded the RIBA as a gold medal in 1923 and is recognised as one of Scotland's finest architects. James Miller, who died in November 1947, is Scotland's most prolific architect. He grew up in rural Perthshire, the son of George, an innkeeper, who became a tenant farmer to the Earl of Canool. Miller was educated at Perth Academy, and he firstly worked in Edinburgh, before finding a job with the engineering department of the Caledonian Railway Company. There he worked on the designs of new stations, including Greenock's Fort Matilda, Gourock Pier and Bridge Street in Glasgow, as well as the city's grand central station. During his long career, he also designed Glasgow Royal Infirmary, St Enoch's Underground and Turnbury and Gleneagles Hotels. He was responsible for designing the interiors of the SS Lusitania and the SS Aquitania, plus numerous banks, commercial buildings and churches in Glasgow and beyond. As the architect chosen to create Glasgow's Empire Exhibition of 1901, he pipped Macintosh to the post. The exhibition was held in Kelvin Grove Park, and many of its buildings were magnificent, including Miller's White and Gold Industrial Hall, inspired by Oriental architecture, and topped by a golden angel with an electric torch symbolising light. Despite the extraordinary output and his considerable architectural contribution to Scotland's heritage, he has received relatively little acclaim until now. Author and architect John Stewart from Kirkintilloch says the two men deserve to be household names because they were, he believes, part of that last great generation of Scottish architects who, along with Mackintosh, William Forrest Salmon, John Campbell, Rowan Anderson, John Kepi, and William Leiper contributed the best of what remains of Glasgow after the loss of so much to post-war planning and comprehensive redevelopment. He adds, what we do know is that both architects rode the wave of Glasgow's extraordinary late 19th and early 20th century economic success at a time when it was one of the wealthiest cities in the world. They put that wealth to good use, creating art of the highest standard in sandstone and granite, and their masterpieces from the period should be treasured accordingly, just as much as any of the finest paintings or sculpture in the Kelvin Grove Art Galleries or the Borough Collection. The life and works of Glasgow architects James Miller and John James Burnett from Whittles Publishing is out now, reports Anne Fotheringham. Evening Times, April 6. Susan Aiken says, We're not all just talk when it comes to tackling poverty. Tackling the Tory cost of living crisis involves taking matters into our own hands whenever and however we can. This week, I was delighted to see the SNP Scottish Government do just that by doubling the child payment, a move which will benefit those families who need it most. Using Scotland's limited social security powers, we are making sure that tens of thousands of children here in Glasgow have the best start in the most difficult of circumstances, 
By the end of this year, as many as 400,000 children across Scotland will receive £25 per week. Families in our most vulnerable communities, those already hardest hit financially, have struggled under years of Westminster austerity. It is hard to believe that while we are still in the midst of the pandemic, the Tory Chancellor decides now is a good time to cut the £20 universal credit uplift, plunging many thousands of Glasgow families further into hardship. Rishi Sunak controls an annual budget of hundreds of billions of pounds. He has the powers to borrow much, much more. But instead, his approach to the cost of living crisis and recovery from the pandemic is forcing ordinary people into further debt. We are now seeing more and more individuals and families with members who are in full-time employment being thrust into extreme poverty. I heard one charity worker at the weekend describe it as a crisis of survival. That is as grim as it is apt for increasing numbers of Glaswegians. In Scotland, we spend hundreds of millions annually mitigating the Tory attacks on those who experience financial hardship, as well as increasing the Scottish child payment to £25 per week. By the end of this year, Scotland's package of family benefits for low-income families will be worth £10,000 by the time a first child turns six, compared to £1,800 in England and Wales. This is part of the SNP's mission to tackle child poverty and build a fairer and more equal Scotland. Here in Glasgow, we are doing our bit too by helping address both the immediate impacts of the current crisis and investing in the longer term blocks to build a fairer and more equal Glasgow. As I have said in this column previously, Glasgow's Tories and Labour both totally ignored the cost of living crisis in their recent city budget proposals, while the SNP put millions into protecting low-income households. And as well as increasing free school meal entitlement and introducing the holiday food programme, the SNP city government has put tackling poverty at the heart of our agenda throughout our first ever council administration in Glasgow. This has included delivering more free hours of quality and accessible childcare quicker than anywhere else in Scotland, promoting digital skills and readying citizens for the world of work and ensuring as many employers as possible pay the Glasgow living wage and are committed to fair work practices. Unlike some others who like to talk about social justice and addressing poverty, the SNP actually delivers. Glasgow's economic success in recent decades has been in no small part down to our creative industries. They have helped build our international reputation as a vibrant and culturally a rich city, while contributing hundreds of millions of pounds annually to Glasgow's economy. The television and film sectors have been a crucial part of that. Over the past five years, the SNP city government has been committed to helping to grow that contribution. Back in our first year, we led a compelling and successful bid for a new Channel 4 base this was a considerable win for the city. Channel 4 has spent more than £200 million on Scotland-based productions since 2007, supporting 400 high-value jobs. A significant proportion of this was in Glasgow. Slowed down somewhat by the pandemic, the decision by the broadcaster to base its biggest creative team here in Glasgow 
has nonetheless promised further growth and greater opportunities for our already flourishing independent producers. The new studio space at Kelvin Hall put in place the other missing jigsaw piece. The decision by the Tory government to go ahead with the sale of Channel 4 seriously risks unravelling much of that progress. Along with leading figures in the sector, I recently wrote to several UK ministers to point out just how self-defeating and short-sighted any sale would be, not just in terms of the damage it would inflict on one of our cultural and economic success stories, but also to their own stated agendas. Channel 4's decision to move whole departments out of London is levelling up in action, spreading the benefits of an internationally regarded broadcaster across the UK. Despite all the UK government's levelling up rhetoric, this move does the exact opposite. Pact, the organisation representing many of the UK's film and television producers, has found that the independent sector is at risk of losing £3.7 billion because of privatisation. And the Exchequer will, over the longer term, lose hundreds of millions of tax income generated year in, year out by those independent producers and their employees, contractors, suppliers. I suspect many in the UK government know this. Channel 4 doesn't cost the public any money. It nurtures new talent. It produces remarkable investigative journalism. So why put it up for sale? And why put Nadine Doris, a minister who didn't even have a clue how Channel 4 operates, in charge of the matter? I suspect the Tory MP Julian Knight probably isn't far off the mark with his comments about revenge against Channel 4 for its coverage of Brexit and its relentless holding the UK government to account, and particularly Boris Johnson to account. Boris's government doesn't like accountability. They see Channel 4 as a bit too lefty. Public service broadcasting is the opposite to what they stand for, and they can get their own back. Once in private hands, it is difficult to see a scenario where Channel 4's new owners did not prioritise shareholder returns over broader public service goals or the importance of the creative economy. This is a grubby, self-serving decision taken in the interests of those opposed to diversity and challenge, not the viewing public, says Susan Aiken. And that was this week's Glasgow Times News podcast, normally recorded in our studio at the Bishop Briggs Media Centre, currently recorded from our volunteers' homes with the publisher's kind permission. Thanks for listening.